Hello, and welcome to Magic is Real, the podcast where we talk about near-death experiences, spiritually transformative experiences, and all things metaphysical and spiritual. I'm your host, Shannon. And if you like this podcast and it resonates with you, it would mean the world if you can like the video, subscribe, share, and please leave comments below, even if it's just a little emoji. It really helps to support the podcast and this project for free. So today I have with me Zachary Price, an ordained minister through the Center for Spiritual Awareness. He is also a clinical chaplain, and he had a near-death experience at the age of 12. But I'm going to let Zachary tell us about himself in his own words, because I don't like to put words in my guest's mouth. So thank you so much, Zachary, for joining me today. It really means a lot. You've done so many of these interviews, and it just means a lot that you said yes to doing another one. Of course, yes. Yeah, they're, these are fun. So yeah, I know. I love so, doing them, too. Well, I'd love to hear, uh, first of all, we're going to talk about your background, but I also, I would love to start by talking about your work, because when you hear ordained minister, people often think of religion. And in this case, you're a minister in a spiritual sense. And I'd love for you to explain what that means to you and talk absolutely. about the work that you do in any way that you'd like to start. Absolutely. Um Okay, so um, first of all, we have to understand most people have connected. Um, well, look at the word minister. I mean, there are ministers in Europe, like there's the Ministry of Defense, there's the Ministry of Housing. I mean, they, they, it's it's just a, a person who is um, helping to um, people to navigate certain situations in life, right, or certain areas of organizational work, right. Um, it can be both, um, but uh, so I'm as I we spoke about earlier on before we were talking before we started this recording. Um, I'm probably the least religious person you'll ever meet in your life because um, religion has everything to do with God, but God has nothing to do with religion. And I think it's an important distinction to make. Uh, one of the best definitions of religion I have ever heard uh, is it was given by Dr. John Kabat-Zinn, um, who wrote, uh, wherever you go, there you are. Uh, he said that uh, the most fundamental meaning of the word religion is man's attempt to appreciate what it means to be alive. And... Um, and I just, I, I think that, I just don't think this, I know this, some of the most spiritual people I have ever met in my life have been atheists and agnostics. Now, I'm not atheist or agnostic, but, but, so, though, so, going by the definition that I just shared with you, uh, man's attempt to appreciate what it means to be alive. Um, these people were Though they didn't have a theistic belief about some god in the sky, um, they they appreciated what it meant to be alive. They were social rights activists. They were human rights activists. They were environmental rights activists. So they were um, advocating life, you know. And um, yeah, that's that's another thing. Uh, so uh, so religion. The word religion actually comes from the two Latin words, uh, re, meaning again, and legare, meaning to tie or bind together. And so it means to tie or bind together again, right? To bind together. Uh, is there another word that you have heard that means to tie or bind together that you would connect with spirituality? Okay. So there's a word called yoga, which comes from Sanskrit. And yoga is the, it comes from the Sanskrit root yug, Y-U-J or G. Uh, and it is the same root from where we derive the word to yoke, to bring together again, right? So religion and yoga have very similar meanings. Uh, and... Uh, so yeah, so so these people um, that that I, these atheists and agnostics that I, I was working with, 
uh, they uh, they were approaching the advocation of life in a secular way, but it was still promoting what it meant to be alive. It had nothing to do with belief. It had to do with how they were living their life, right? And so I think that's important when we talk about spirituality and when we engage in spirituality, spiritual work, is it it shouldn't be this airy, fairy, a dreamy thing that most people make it out to be. It should be practical. The people who came up with these ideas and concepts and practices and techniques they were they they were nomads really they were traveling from one place to another they couldn't they didn't have time to 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 waste thinking about these things that that um we just take for granted today because we can sit in one spot um so they so how they were approaching it had to have practicality in their life it had to be practical it had to help them in their life so these so i'm a big fan and an advocate for practical spirituality um, if it, it has to have a practical utility in your life, if not, then it's just entertainment, right? These types of podcasts, I think, and the, what I talk about on them is it's, it's rooted in the way we live our lives. And I think it should be because if not, it's just entertainment and it's not really helping anybody. And, um, yeah, that ties into my work as a clinical chaplain. It ties into my work as a speaker, as a teacher. And, um, I'm not poo-pooing anyone's you know, if that if they want to be have these airy fairy beliefs and stuff, that's fine. That's okay. If it if it if it suits you, you know, that's great. You know, all the power, all more power to you. But for me, especially in the work I do, helping people uh, as they're in the process of dying, um, I find that it, it's it's most helpful if, if all of these, everything I say, all the prayers that I share, all the groups that I lead, all the audiences I speak to that um and the people i consult with pri privately that that our conversations have an impact on their life and uh it can be it's practical i really appreciate that i appreciate that i feel like i'm on a tangent right now sorry I, not at all I no i was going to say that just... resonates a hundred percent and i i think sometimes we feel like we're rambling but it all is landing it all makes perfect sense i feel like it's very well articulated uh, just briefly, let's talk about uh, your work as a chaplain. You you said it, you explained it to me really well before we turned on the camera. I'd love to hear more about that as well. Sure, sure. Uh, well, I'm a clinical chaplain. Uh, it's a long story that I shared with you before we yeah. begin the interview. But uh, so essentially what a clinical chaplain is, is um, it's a, a cross between a minister and a therapist. So what I do is I, my job is not to convert anyone to any specific belief system, right? I'm not here to promote any religion, right? I'm here to help people to get into touch with the deeper part of themselves that they've always been aware of, they've always connected to, that sometimes they just weren't aware of it, um, at least in a, in a conscious way. Um, so what I do is uh, I work with people who are either in the process of dying or are very sick, or they've gone some through some traumatic event, and um, and I work with their families. And I, what I do is I take, I talk to them about their belief system, whatever that may be. They could be Christian or Hindu, or Muslim or Buddhist or atheist, or agnostic, right? Um, or completely non-religious. That you just not think about these things at all. But my job is to take whatever model of belief they have and to use however they connect to the divine even if they don't call it the divine the essence of life my job is to help them to use that model whatever it may be and to help them to navigate through their experience of suffering and then to establish a life enhancing meaning on the other side of that journey so um everything in my life has become about that now and um yeah I and mean, even you know when i perform music for it's the same thing you know when i have these conversations it's about the same thing it's uh helping people to become more aware through the struggles of their lives of the wholeness that the eternal wholeness that has existed there always and um to help them to find meaning through through that darkness 
That's a beautiful way to be of service. Yeah. I actually remember. Oh, go ahead. Sometimes I don't feel like that's really being absurd. It's, I feel like I get more out of it than, yeah. than the people I work with do. I understand yeah. that. That's the beauty is when you can be of service, but it also fills you up as well. Mm -hmm. I feel that way about mediumship as well. Um, but yeah, I remember being eight years old and I had a, a large birthmark on my face that I had removed and I had to have like plastic surgery. And I was a kid. Actually, I was only seven. And uh, yeah, they had a chaplain come in, which um, I, I still remember to this day. I don't really remember what, I think, I don't exactly remember what the conversation was, but you're a kid and you're in a hospital and there's all these other kids that are in there. And it's just nice to have somebody come and make sure you're okay. So I think I was a little like, I don't know what this is, but it's also, it was comforting. So let's go back to your, your childhood, your background. I know your NDE happened when you were very young, um, but anything you'd like to share about before the accident, um, what what was your life like? Did, were you raised in spirituality or not? I come from uh, a staunchly secular family. Yeah, me too. Um, uh, and uh, like nothing, we never had spiritual conversations, religious conversations. I come from the Bible Belt. Like I grew up in the Bible Belt, so I heard these. I heard this all the time, but I'd never gone. You know, I never went to church. We never went to church. You know, as a family. Um, uh, but I, but looking back now, I have certain things that, uh, experiences that I had when I was a child that looking back on it now, I can say, huh, that was kind of a pointer that, you know, and I didn't realize that it was pointing me in this direction now, but it was like, that's, I wasn't even, this wasn't even in my real house of thinking that I'd be doing this type of work when I was a kid. I was going to be, I come from a family of pilots and farmers. So I was going to be a crop duster or fly in the military when I, when I grew up. Um, but uh, yeah. And then, then, um, and then I turned 12 and my accident happened. Um, uh, and that changed everything. It changed everything. Yeah. Let's talk about that. Although if you have a specific about what kind of point, I love these stories um about these little things that we see when we're younger that we don't put together as being a spiritual experience or even mm -hmm. like our destiny and i'm writing a book right now and talking about that it's so fascinating to me watching as you get older you're like oh it's all coming together i see mm -hmm. these little like you said these little pointers could you can you remember any in, uh in particular well i um i'll talk about this a little bit later in the interview uh, yeah but when I was a kid, uh, this would happen almost every night when I, when I went to sleep. And I would just lay in bed uh, before I would fall asleep. And I would just, I would be listening to the quiet. And, and this still happens to me to this very day. It happens to me every time I'm in quiet. In fact, I can hear it right now. Um, that... Uh, this silence becomes loud to me. Mm -hmm. Silence is loud. Sometimes, sometimes I remember when I was caring for my grandmother. Um. Uh, well, as she was passing, um, and we talked about this, you know, before. Uh, I would just lay there in bed, and you know, it, trying to be, you know, at least mildly cognizant, so I could get that get to where she needed me. Um, and I would listen to the to the silence, and it would become deafening. And as it turns out, and I've heard I heard this when I was a kid. Um, as it turns out, you've heard the 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 word that's used in Buddhism and uh, Hinduism a lot called Om. O M. Mm -hmm. Okay. Om is uh, it is the primordial sound of existence. And is it is the proclamation or indication of the it's the underlying hum that exists uh, in the proclamation the um, of, of of God of God and uh, and it's um, 
and it's it's beneath every sound that that you hear it's it's within science it's 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 very it's it's part of yogic philosophy it's very deep and i didn't know what that was when i was a kid i had no idea um but i was hearing that when i was growing up and i still hear and it's there's nothing spe- I'm not, nothing special about me it's just that i think everyone can hear it you're just tuned into it. it yeah i was gonna say yeah. where mm-hmm. your attention yeah. goes energy it's, flows energy flows is the word is the, thank you for finishing that because i couldn't remember mm-hmm. i even mm-hmm. I've always just seen particles in the air. Like I, in when I when it's dark, I don't see dark. I see little fuzzy, which we all do. Like there's mm-hmm. there's matter there, but we just don't tune into it. And when we do tune into it, we notice that it's not black. It's all different colors. It's just like mm-hmm. all colors of the the spectrum of light. So I think that's, that's another, really that's another thing I would see when I was a kid. I would yeah. I would lay I would lay there in the darkness and I would just I would just stare at this. It wasn't dark. It wasn't black. It was just. No. Yeah, it's static. It's like colorful static. Uh, mm-hmm. So yeah, um, however you'd like to start talking about your actual the accident and what happened. Sure, sure. Well, um, so I have uh, one half sister. Um, she we have different fathers, um, and I was raised by my mother, um, and. Uh, one morning um on february 12th of 1998 we were she was taking us to school uh i was in the sixth grade at this point and um my sister she's two years younger than me uh she's in the fourth grade and um my mom was taking both of us to school and um we were running late this particular morning and um you know, my sister, I remember that she had gotten, uh, it was close, getting close to Valentine's Day. It was February 12th. And uh, she had gotten cards that she was, because they were going to have a Valentine's Day card, you know, party. Because, you know, when you're in elementary school, you know, you have, you know, all holidays that come by, you have a Halloween party, a Valentine's Day party, a Christmas party, you know, the kids do that. And so she had got, bought all these Valentine's Day cards for all her friends at school. And, um, and she had forgotten them at home. And that also made me think, oh, God, I have homework. I was supposed to, I, I finished last night. I forgot my homework. And so we were asking our mom to turn around and go back to, to get this stuff. And, but she was already running late. So we were begging her anyway. But as she, she decided she was going to turn around and go back. And uh, as she turned around, she lost control of the car. And... Uh, And then I remember everything going black. Why? Well, first of all, I remember everything starting to happen in slow motion. And then I remember everything going black. And there are literally, literally, there are no words to describe what I experienced. Um, my, my experience, I think, was a bit different than most NDEs I've ever heard. Most of the time, you know, people will see a white light. They will go to the white light. They'll meet, they'll meet loved ones who've passed away. They'll meet spirit guides, you know. And I'm not saying that's not wrong, but that's not what I experienced. That's not what I remember. Um, there are literally no words to describe what I experienced. Um, first of all, uh, what I experienced was not linear because there was no time, there was no past, there was no future, everything was now, it was happening right now. Um, everything everything was happening at once. Uh, there was a, a beauty unlike anything I've ever experienced before in this life. Like in this life, like when we experience things, right? Things are beautiful, but there were no things there. It was just, it was just raw beauty. And we we can't, like I said, there are no words. You can't really articulate this in a way that we can linguistically express this. You know? Um it was it was more than just beauty. It was it was the essence of what beauty is. It was um 
I've used this term several times. Um, I don't think I'm the one who came up with this term, but I thought I was, but I'm not. It was the quintessence of beauty. It was the the very essence of what beauty is. Um, and um, also there was no difference there. There was no separation. There was no, everything that I was experiencing there was no difference between me and that. I was, it was the I am presence. It was, I am that, you know, I knew that I was that. Um, uh, like I said, there was no, there was no separation. Uh, there was no difference between subject and object. There was no, there was no difference between noun and verb. So, what I was experiencing was the process of the being, it's the being, the being of what I was experiencing. So it was, like I said, there were no words there. It was also, um, there was no, I couldn't, like I said, I couldn't distinguish my individual self from the profundity of what I was experiencing. And I guess I've said that in several ways now, but um, also there was a knowing unlike anything I've ever experienced before in my life. Um, there was nothing that was not known. Um, the, and uh, it was just, it was just simply the I am presence. It was just, you know, when it talks about this in all religious and spiritual scriptures, the the I am presence the um God that's the name of God right um in religious in you know in uh, in the Bible you know it says there's the story of Moses have you heard the story of you've heard the story of Moses before yes have you heard that story before yes yeah. so you know he encounters he encounters something called a burning bush like he's herding mm -hmm. sheep one day and he encounters um this bush that's on fire that's not consumed by the fire and um and he has the the bush starts talking to him. Uh, and the bush says, go set your people free because, you know, the story of Moses, he was a Hebrew slave who was raised in the court, in the royal court of Egypt. Um, and so they, but his people were enslaved by Egypt, but he you know, ran away. And one day he encounters this burning bush and the bush, you know, says, go back and set your people free. You know, God was talking to him, um, at least according to the story through the bush. And uh, he said, sure, I'll do this. I'll go set my people free. But who do I say sent me? Who gives me the, who do I say gives me the authority to do this? And the bush says, I am that I am. That is my name now and for all future generations. So I am is the name of God, right? It's interesting to me that no matter who you are, no matter where you're from, no matter what you believe, everyone identifies themselves as I am. In fact, you said the name of you said the name of God before you even said your name when we introduce each other. We introduce to each other. We say the name of God before we we introduce like we say our own name. Like you said, hi. I am, you know, yeah. Torrance, right? Uh and I said hi, I am Zach, right? So um we so so there's this I am presence that is expressing itself um, behind and before the individuality comes. Our, we we express our individuality, right? Our persona, right? So so that's an, another interesting thing. The word persona. We each have personas. Uh, persona comes from the Greek origin, the Greek word persona, which um, we have personas, but the Greek it meant in Greek, it meant different, uh, something different. In, per, in Greek, it persona was the mask that actors wore on stage, literally. So, literally, the the our persona is the mask that we are wearing. That this I am presence is wearing, and through which it expresses itself into the world. And, uh, and this is a pretty deep topic, but. Um, you know, I could talk about this for a long time, but, but, uh, yeah, yeah. So 
I got off on a huge tangent there. But, I love uh, it. It's a great so, tangent. It's exactly where I want to go. But so, so the accident happened. Um, and then I start, like I said, I come from the secular family. Um, but I started looking for answers, asking people that I knew to explain to me what had happened to me. What was that I experienced? And I started going to a bunch of different churches, uh, all the temples I could go to, the synagogue, I mean, every, every, all the religious things I could go to, I would go to looking for answers to explain what I'd experienced. And people were able to give me a bunch of fundamentalist rules and principles and dogmas and rules and regulations, but no one was able to tell me based on experience what I experienced. They te- they, you know, they would tell me what they read in a book somewhere or someone had told them, but nothing that was based on something I could really pin my attention to. Right? Um, and so, uh, yeah, and then I moved away. I went to school all throughout my 20s. Um, and then uh, I, you know, I, I told you I've studied other things before I came back to this. Um, and in 2011, my grandmother, the woman who um, who actually stayed in the hospital with me while I was, you know, while I was coming out of my coma and while I was healing, and, uh, and I was in the hospital for about three months, and uh, she adopted me. She took me in after that, and she raised me for the rest, you know, you know, until I graduated high school, and um, so. And then you know, I graduated high school. I went out into the world. And in 2011, she was diagnosed with nasal pharyngeal cancer, which is cancer of the pharynx and um, uh, right here around the voice box. Right, And she'd smoked most of her life um, since she was like 16, I think. And uh, so... Uh, she was diagnosed and then I wasn't living with her at that point, but I was living up in Vermont. And when I found, and about a year, year and a half after she was diagnosed with cancer, because of the treatments that she had been going through, she attempted suicide uh, because she had lost over half of her body weight. She was depressed out of her mind. She felt like she had no meaning in life anymore. And, um, and so she, as I said, she attempted suicide. And when I found out that she had tried this, I dropped everything I was doing um, and I became a live-in caregiver for her until she passed away in 2016. And uh, that was the event, her attempt at suicide. It completely, it's the straw that broke the camel's back and put me back into um, pursuit of spirituality and reminded me of things that I had been experiencing up until that point and um and so i you know i um you know i started my graduate work after she passed away uh uh finished my graduate degree in theology um and my second undergraduate degree in piano uh and i help i use music a lot to help people um in the clinical setting and then I also I also play piano uh, at all the retirement facilities in the town in which I live, um, two or three times a month for for these uh, for the folks that are there because music is so healing. And then yeah, yeah. So that guy, I think that guy gets up to gets us to close to where I am now. I mean, there's more, but yeah, yeah. That's thank you for sharing all of that. I know it's I don't I doubt I don't know that. It sounds like you remember much of the accident, but I want to show reverence to the fact that that's a really traumatic event. And I wanted to know, with that in mind, coming back and then just the the uh, effects of the accident and what you lost, um, how did you how did you find reintegration after this okay, experience? Well, well um as I said, my experience was different than most people's. Yeah. I can't tell you a story of something that happened to me because that's not what my experience was. Um, my experience was just the presence of the I am. It was just the presence of, you know, for lack of a better word, God, consciousness, pure, unadulterated consciousness. 
Um, and um, so I'd like you to imagine that, okay, so it has taken 26 years for me to finally cultivate the right language to be able to articulate, at least to point to what I experienced. Um, because what I experienced, there were no words, there was no, there was no, there was none, there, were the, this, this, there was none of this. It was a completely different way of existing. And um, so it has taken me 26 years to finally cultivate the, the right vocabulary and vernacular to be able to express what I experienced, and at least in a mildly understandable way. Um, and so, and as I, after my, after I came out of my coma in the years that proceed that, you know, followed that little things would begin to happen. Like I would begin to remember things. Oh, oh, this happened in the accident. Oh, oh. And, th and then like for years, I didn't even remember anything that had happened before my accident. I just knew that I was alive. <laughs> But now that slowly memories from before my accident started to come back in. And, um, and then I'll, I'll, ex I'll like, ex there'll be a bunch of deja vu that will happen to me from time to time. Uh, that's something I'll hear, or it'll bring up an idea that I hadn't I never thought about before things I'll experience. And I'll say, Oh, Oh, I knew this, 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 this was from the accident. This is something I was told in the accident or I was, I realized in the accident. Um, and, um, so, and it kind of works the same way that we live our lives. So in that realm, right in the realm of eternity, which is what I experienced when I died. So I can imagine here is eternity, right? And there's a line and then below that line, there is this place of duality. Okay. So. Firstly, um, this place of eternity, um, there's no difference. There's no, there's no um, judgment. There's no, there's, it's just complete presence of being, right? It's just God, right? Um, and then here we have difference, right? But all of this is actually happening here, just in a different way. So before I get to this, more of this. So imagine, do you know how a computer works? Like you, I, I do not know uh, how a computer works. Okay. Okay. Well, so, okay. So, yeah. so uh, this is as an analogy that I've kind of put together to kind of explain how I understand how everything's happening right now. Okay. So the definition of a computer, a computer by definition is any device that stores and processes information. That is what a computer is. That's all a computer does. It stores and processes information, right? Now, in this realm of existence, this place of eternity, everything is happening at one time. Our brains, physical brains, all they do is store and process information. That's all they do. They don't create any, it doesn't create anything. That's our job. But the brain is just a tool, right? So it stores and processes information. So if you put in too much information into any one computer at one time, what happens to the computer? It explodes. It crashes. <laughs> it crashes, right? Yeah. So, so as a safeguard, so that our computers do not explode, so that we don't have strokes, so that we don't have some sort of aneurysm or something, they are designed to process information in a linear way. Thus, we have a past, we have a future, right? We are constantly, we are progressively moving forward along this timeline, right? So our, our, our computers, our brains are designed to process life in that way. Some, some computers, some people's computers have larger hard drives. They have more RAM, right? So I wouldn't say they process they process things differently and quick, quickly. I wouldn't say they move through time quickly because that's not the same thing. But so all of us are processing or experiencing this realm of eternity in a linear way right now. 
right? So um, that is one of the things that I've kind of gathered that I've finally gotten the language to be able to express that idea. It's not it's not completely accurate, but it's pretty close. Um, and so as time has gone by, like I've experienced a lot of senses of deja vu that have said, told to me, hey, hey, you need to be doing this or you need to, you know, hey, this is what you experienced in your, in your, in your accent. This is, you know, um, this can help people. So, yeah, um, I feel like I went off on a whole nother tangent there. That's what I love. I love that exploring the quantum physics of it all. I was going to ask you how it's changed your perception of the world, which you just answered. You anticipated my needs. And mm -hmm. I think it's a really fascinating topic. It's, I'm assuming you've seen the movie Everything, Everywhere, All at Once. Have you seen mm -hmm. it? Yes. Um, mm -hmm. And again, it's a, it's a heady concept, but I think the way you explained it makes sense. And I do think that computers are modeled after human brains. It's just an artificial... Mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's an artificial model of the human brain. It does what the human brain does. So I think that's a really good way to explain it. And that the only reason we have linear time in this 3D world is because otherwise we would explode and crash because it doesn't make We have to make sense of it. We have to have some order in this human self, in this lower vibrational dimension. Otherwise, if we were to see everything there is to see, first of all, why would we be here? Um, mm -hmm. If we already knew what we were and we already mm -hmm. had a full memory of what where we came from, mm -hmm. there wouldn't be much point to coming here and learning through these human bodies where we have physical, like mm -hmm. you said, material things to grab mm -hmm. onto, to value. And it's what we do with it that mm -hmm. I think is the reason we're here. It's to, mm -hmm. let's say that you're sort of limited to, cr you're crunched mm -hmm. down into this meat suit, as they call it, and what happens and how do you con how do you face challenges? How do you face adversity? How do you choose love or not choose love? And I think that's kind of what we're doing here. What do you think we're doing here? Um, I think we're. I think the reason we're here is to um, is to realize who we are. Is to um, there is a. I've, these are stories I've shared on a bunch of other podcasts. Um, so. There are two there are two things I'd like to talk about here. So what do I think we're doing here? Okay. Um, so the first thing, first story I'd like to tell you is a story about a man in a white room. Have you heard this story before? No. Okay. So there's a man and he exists and he's just, he's in a white room. And uh, he's always existed within the white room. Since his inception, he has always existed within the white room. The walls are white, the ceiling is white, the floor is white, as well as the man. The man is entirely white as well. How does the man know he is in a white room? That's a question for you. Uh, yeah, um, I would say he he doesn't because he has nothing to compare it to. Right, right. So he has no idea how clean, how holy, how pure, everything that white indicates, he has no idea about that. So in order for him to understand what white is, he has to experience what white is not. Contrast. So he has to experience all the different colors of the rainbow, right? All the emotional, all the, the degrees of emotion, the, you know, everything, right? So that when he goes back to this white room, he can more deeply, more profoundly, more completely appreciate what white is, right? And so, um, you know, in, in ancient, uh, especially uh, Eastern concepts, they say that uh, this is something called Lila. This is the play uh, in God's mind. This is this is a play happening within God's mind, mind of God, um, and we are all already whole and complete. Um, we are just in the process, the process of life, becoming. You know, I. 
Well, before I get to that, there's another story I'd like to share. So uh, are you familiar with Michelangelo's David? Yes. Okay. Uh, have you heard this story before about, uh, have you heard me tell this story before? No, tell it. Okay. Okay. So or do, or do you know how they, how David came about? I guess that is, I guess that's the question. I don't think I remember. So okay. please share. Okay. So one day, uh, Michelangelo was carving. Um, I think he'd, uh, I think he was maybe carving. I think he was, he was working on David. And maybe he had already carved a couple of others, of other statues like the Pietà or his other stuff. Um, and someone walked up behind him and they said, uh, how do you, how do you create such beauty with your work? How do you do this? And um, Michelangelo thought about it. He said, meet me today after I get through working here. And I want to take you down to the rock quarry and I want to show you something. So uh, at the end of the day, the guy shows up and they go together down to the rock quarry where Michelangelo got all of his built his artistic materials, his, you know, the stone that he used to carve the marble. You know, stone to carve the marble. This the marble he got to to um, do his carvings. Uh, and so he pointed down into the rock quarry and he said, You see down there all the all that marble in the in the mountain there? And uh, he said, Yeah. He said, inside that um, all that rock there, inside that marble, there is an angel. My job is to set her free. So, according to Michelangelo and my understanding of uh, our processing through this life, uh, David already existed, whole and complete and perfect. Michelangelo's job, as he saw it, was to chip away everything that was not David. Um, and so every time we go through something painful, we go through contrast in life, we are literally going through, a, 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 there's a type of carving that's happening that is, is chipping away life, God, you know, is chipping away a part of us that we didn't really need. So that our authenticity, the, the authentic self, the real essence of us is revealed in a more full and grounded way. Life is that. Life is this, is this carving, is this, is this revealing, right? Is, uh, um, you know, I, I heard uh, another word, uh, invent the word invent it's a word that we we were all familiar with right um but the invent invent the word invent actually didn't originally mean to create something it meant um i think it's in and vinere or something like that which is uh latin uh i think that's how you pronounce the word vinere um but it means to come upon or to to realize to come to right to um so if you're coming to something something is not created you were discovering something you were uncovering something that already existed right so everything that we ever will be already exists now we are just in the process of wiping the dust off the mirror so that we can finally see the reflection clearly um and another word Holy, the word holy, you've probably heard me talk about this before because this is something I've shared in a lot of my interviews. So the word holy, um, if you ask the average person um, what the word holy means, they'll say, oh, it means God. It means this, uh, oh, it's this, I, I can't really put it into words. It's uh, pure, clean, right? Um, uh, sanctified. And then you ask them, well, what does all that mean? And they'll carry it through this whole rabbit hole. But the word holy uh, um, comes from the old English word halig, H-A-L-I-G, uh, which is the same root 
from where we get the word whole or complete, entire. Um, now, if you look in like Hebrew scripture or Judeo-Christian scripture, they'll say that the word holy means set apart, but that's not true. The word that they're referring to is the word kodesh, which is a Hebrew word, which does mean set apart, but it means holy in a different way. But the word holy, the actual word holy comes from the ancient, um, the Old English word halig, right? It's the same root from where we get the word whole. Um, and it's also, so, so here you have the word whole. So up here is it in eternity, right? Back to the side, you have eternity and then the line and then below it, you have duality, eternity, whole, holiness exists here. This is the only place that holiness can exist. Complete, whole, entire, right? Down here. So imagine at this end, you have the word whole. The opposite of the word whole is what? The opposite of the word word whole. Mm -hmm. I mean, I could mm -hmm. say empty. It's not empty, but it's something like that. I don't know. Okay, what so do you come up with? And so, in religious terms, because uh, that's kind of in the realm that we're kind of playing right now, uh, the opposite of the word whole could that is op the the word that's often linked to the opposite of the word whole is the word sin, mm. right? And sin is not actually a religious word. It is now, but it wasn't originally. Oh yeah, it, actually it comes, means without. In certain la in some languages, sin is without. Mm -hmm. I never thought about that. Wow. <laughs> so 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 so, but sin also uh, comes from the word archery. It comes from the practice of archery. So if you shoot, if you're practicing archery and you shoot the arrow and you miss the mark. You've sinned. That's what that means. Right? So, um, but in order to be able to learn to hit the bullseye, you have to sin a lot to get there to, to really, you know, but you have to do it consciously because sin can be a learning mechanism if it's approached with the right intention. Right? So, as you, you shoot the arrow, you shoot the arrow, you keep shooting it, missing the mark, you know, learning learning the process of learning and finally you're able to hit the bullseye every time right so this place of separation this place of sin like i said can this uh that concept of sin can be a learning mechanism if it's approached with the right intention so this place of sin on this side and wholeness on this side the process of getting from here the journey of getting from this place of separation to this place of completion this also, it's a word that also comes from the same root that the word holy comes from. Can you guess what it is? Mm -mm. This place of sickness, believed separation, illness, darkness, back to a place of wholeness again. The word is heal. So the process of getting from here, you know, illness, disillusionment, sickness, separation, back to a place of wholeness, completeness, health, which also comes from the same root. That is the process of healing, which also links to the idea of learning, realizing things, seeing things, coming to terms with things, and finally seeing the truth of something with your real eyes. You realize it. Um, and so, yeah, the, the li our lives are the process of becoming who we are, not becoming something new. Like they also say, like evolu the word evolution, like the word evolution, people think, well, it's it's something becoming something new. No, 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 it's not. That's not what evolution is. Evolution is actually the unfolding of something that has always existed. Like another one of my favorite words is. Uh, it's an ancient Greek word, and it, uh, it's the word entelechy. You'll like this. The word entelechy um, is, okay, so to describe what entelechy is, um, I may have it actually here. Let's see. I don't know if I do, though. Mm. 
much. There it is. Okay. So this is an acorn. You can see that. Okay. So you have the acorn and the oak tree. The oak tree is the entelechy of the acorn. The most fully perfectly realized version of what this can be already exists within it. The life process of the acorn becoming the entelechy is simply the realization of its potential. That is what entelechy means. So we all have entelechies. You have an entelechy. I have an entelechy, right? I just actually just wrote an article for a magazine on this. Um, but it's, uh, and the, our entelechy at the end of the day is complete wholeness, complete happiness, love, you know, completion uh, as one being. Um, uh, but our lives are the process of realizing that. But then we have individual entelechies, so the most perfectly realized versions of ourselves as well that lead to that. So, yeah. I love it. Thank you so much. That was so interesting. And that's why I told you in the beginning, I just wanted you to go wherever you wanted to go, because I think sure. what needs to be revealed will be revealed. And I thank you so much for lending your time and your energy. And again, showing up and sharing the insights that you have and your experience so vulnerably, but also so informatively. I think it's really great food for thought. So thank you so much, Zachary Price for being here today. Is there anything else that you wanted to share before we go? Anything you're working on or you want to share generally? Um, well, uh, if anyone is interested, uh, in about two weeks, I will be leading a uh, yoga and meditation retreat uh, in northern Georgia at the CSA, the Center for Spiritual Awareness, uh, the organization to which I am a minister. Um, I'll be teaching there for about a week. Uh, I'll be teaching something called Kriya Yoga, which is, uh, it's, a, it's an internal, well, part of it is an internal yoga. Um, and if you are interested or you want to learn more, um, just contact me, reach reach out, and uh, I'll be leading the retreat from, um, we'll actually be holding retreats there all summer. Well, it's been going on all throughout the summer, but uh and it'll go on through August, I believe. I think we'll be holding silent retreats through August. But I will be teaching um, uh, the principle of non-duality um, for a week up there. Um, and uh, yeah, I wish we could have talked about that. I mean, about the idea of uh, non-duality and experiencing the I am presence in the present moment. I think we can. Um, I think we should do a follow up because I'm really interested in that. Yeah. And where can people reach you? Okay. Well, they, you can. Email. I'm in the process of setting up um, a website um, because I've been having so many people reach out to me. I don't have all the time, <laughs> enough time. So I've got to figure out a way to like organize everything. And I want to talk to you about it because you do this. Yeah. Um, uh, so uh, I'll be setting up a website, uh, but you can reach me now at uh, a found meaning at gmail.com. And I think you. you'll probably put this in the notes. Yes. Uh, thank you so, so much. Yeah. yeah, thank you. This is wonderful. And I look forward to keeping in touch and hearing more about what you have to share when you have the bandwidth and time. <laughs> but uh, thank you again for showing up today. It really Absolutely. means a lot.